Today on Know the Truth, a new message from Philip DeCourcy. Have you got your camouflage on and your boots laced up, or are you sitting on the easy chair with your feet up? Paul is saying, hey, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There's a war on. Souls are at stake. The glory of Jesus Christ on planet Earth is at the center of this conflict. Where are you? Welcome to Know the Truth, I'm Wayne Shepherd. Too often Christians find themselves weighed down with the cares of the world, but 2 Timothy 2.4 says, a good soldier of Christ doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this life. Today, Philip DeCourcy continues a series on how to live faithfully without regret and without apology for God's kingdom. It's a message titled Picture Perfect from the Without Apology series. Revisit your favorite lessons online at ktt.org. Now, Here's Pastor Philip. We're in a series of expositions on 2 Timothy. This is Paul's swan song, Paul's last letter. Before he graduates to heaven, he's writing to a young man. He schooled in Christ. And I think one of the themes of this book is unashamed. Several times, Paul will tell Timothy not to be ashamed of him as a prisoner of the gospel not to be ashamed of the master and his message. So we have entitled this series Without Apology. This culture wants to bludgeon us into silence, wants to push us to the side as an irrelevancy, who wants us to keep our faith private behind the walls of our churches. And so we encourage you to break down those walls. We encourage you to fight back and be a man who lives for Christ without apology. And so Paul's going to help us to do that by encouraging us with three wonderful images of the Christian man and the Christian ministry. So these are picture perfect, and you and I want to live up to these images. During the days when men didn't push strollers or change diapers, a husband was out with his wife and child for dinner, and the child began to cry. And having spent the day taking care of the child, his wife was exhausted and wanted a break, and so she asked her husband to change the son's diaper. He said, well, I I don't know how to change a baby, and you know what? I really don't think I could do it. Well, she looked at him with a withering look, realizing that he was a baseball fan. She said this, look, Buster, you lay the diaper out like a diamond. You put a second base on home plate, put the baby's bottom on the pitcher's mound, hook up first and third, and slide home underneath. And if it starts to rain, the game isn't called. You start all over again. (laughs) Now, the moral of the story is what? The moral of the story is if you're going to get your message across, you better learn to speak the person's language. You better learn to communicate within their world. And I would suggest to you that the biblical writers were good at that. They drew images from everyday life. They understood that the mind is not a filing cabinet as much as it is a picture gallery. And they understood that an effective teacher turns ears into eyes by the use of metaphor and simile and illustration. And as we turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 3 to 7, we find the apostle Paul doing just that. He takes everyday images and he turns them into ministry metaphors. Like the other biblical writers, Paul sought to draw a word picture that would connect with Timothy and communicate the need for Timothy to make an enduring commitment to the gospel. That's what Paul is doing here. This is a call to commitment. It's rooted in chapter 1 and verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Paul picks that theme up again in chapter 2 and verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before he's done, he will challenge Timothy again towards the end of the letter, chapter 4, verse 5. But you be watchful in all things, 
endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, suffer, be strong, endure. And to underscore that message, Paul takes three pictures from everyday life, and he communicates to Timothy from within his world, and he encourages him to endure. He encourages him through these vivid images of devotion, discipline, and diligence. There's nothing easy about being a soldier. There's nothing easy about being an athlete. There's nothing easy about being a farmer. The soldier must stay on mission. The athlete must ever be disciplined. The farmer must put in long and laborious hours. And that's the point of these pictures. With these three metaphors, Paul is firing up Timothy's imagination so that he can indeed give himself with white-hot commitment to Jesus Christ, the message of Jesus Christ, and the mission that Jesus gave to his followers. So, let's look at these pictures and see a wonderful outline of Christian ministry and service. In fact, just if you're taking notes, if you want to later on, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 and 24, and you'll find these three images used by Paul once again, the athlete, the soldier, and the farmer. Here's an outline. The soldier speaks of singular devotion. The athlete speaks of strenuous discipline. The farmer speaks of steadfast diligence. So let's jump right in with these three wonderful images, metaphors for ministry. Number one, devotion. The first of the three images points to the devotion of the soldier. Look at verse 3. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this world, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. This was one of Paul's favorite images. Back in chapter 1 of the first letter to Timothy, he tells him in chapter 1 and verse 18 to wage warfare. In chapter 6 and verse 12 of that first letter, he tells him to fight a good fight of faith. And here we are, again in the second letter, drawing upon this image of soldiering. You know Paul's most famous use of this image in Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 18, where we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. And Paul calls the church at Ephesus to put on the whole armor of God and stand in the evil day, having all they can do to stand. So Paul loves this image, and it shouldn't surprise us that he would draw a picture from the military world because the world in which Paul lived was basically a military state. Don't forget that he endured two imprisonments and found himself in the company of Roman soldiers often. In fact, there may have been a time during which he himself was chained to a Roman soldier. This is a very familiar picture to Paul and Timothy. And it's a wonderful picture because Paul is trying to encourage Timothy to suffer, to stand strong, to endure for the gospel's sake. Because you see, Timothy had the fight against his natural timidity. Timothy looked at Paul and saw him in prison for the gospel and must have asked himself, do I want that for myself? Paul tells us that there was no home field advantage because the culture in which Timothy lived was one that was Christless and opposed to the gospel. And so Timothy would have to indeed show some strength and courage and faithfulness, all words that are in the vocabulary of the soldier. And that's why Paul draws upon this image, because what's an army? It's a company of the committed. And military life was a hard life by matter of course. So if Paul wants to encourage Timothy to endure, to be courageous, to stand up, against all that's opposing him, well then, the image of the soldier is a good one. And what Paul is really saying here, if I was to summarize it, Timothy, the soldier will take his fair share of rough treatment, and so must you as a follower of Jesus Christ. I've told you before that when June and I were celebrating our 25th anniversary, 
I took her down to San Diego for the weekend, and we were enjoying a cup of tea on Coronado Island on a beautiful, sunny California afternoon when I reminded myself that one of my friends may be on the Navy SEAL base, and I decided to give him a call and see if we could drop in and see all that was going on. I thought Jim would enjoy that on our 25th anniversary you know, but she, as a good, obedient, and loving wife, she tagged along, and actually, as the day unfolded, she enjoyed it thoroughly, and we did get on the base, and we did get to see a little bit of the training that was going on with a new batch of Navy SEALs, and you saw the rigor, the discipline that these guys had to endure, and our friend showed us around, and one of the lasting memories for June and myself was standing on the parade ground, and we noticed that there were two signs not far from us. One of them said, the enemy thanks you today for not giving 100%. And the other one said, and this is one of the Navy SEALs' mantras, yesterday was your easiest day. No bedtime stories on the Navy SEAL base. Yesterday was your easiest day. Because you see, rough treatment is a matter of course for the Roman soldier, the Army Ranger, the Navy SEAL, And that's what Paul is getting at here. Ministry is not a playground, it's a battleground. Prayer is wrestling. That's the image Paul uses. Taking up the Word of God is taking up a sword. Establishing holiness is a fight. It's a fight to the death. Put your flesh to death. You look at all these images Evangelism is an arduous campaign waged against the enemy who holds our family and friends captive at his will. It's a rescue mission. All the images of ministry are military, and they convey this idea of arduous commitment and courage. Now, there's two things that jump out quickly as we look at the devotion of the soldier. And also notice this, the focus in this passage is not on the enemy. It's on the soldier. And there's two things that kind of stand out if you're taking notes. Number one, Paul talks about enlistment, and then Paul talks about entanglement. Look at what he says in verse 4. Now, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. You need to underscore that you're an enlisted man. Several of you have served our country valiantly and admirably in the armed forces, and we thank you for your service. You're an enlisted man in that sense, but all of us are enlisted men in this sense, that the moment we got saved, the moment we got redeemed, we got recruited. We crossed over the line and joined Jesus' side. We went from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear Son. We swapped sides. We became enlisted. In fact, Jesus is described in Hebrews 2 verse 10 as what? The captain of our salvation. The moment we put our faith in Christ, we were immediately drafted into God's army, and we came under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And if you're an enlisted man, what's life about? It's about obeying orders. That's what it's about. It's shutting up and doing what you're told. No belly aching, no excuses. Just straighten up and listen to the captain of our salvation and what he calls every one of us to do. No neutrality. We're always on active service. We're always ready to come to attention and follow orders. In fact, metaphorically, maybe it's not a bad thing even to do it literally. Get up in the morning and just come to attention, salute and say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? What is it? that is your will for my life today. We're enlisted, man. And I think sometimes we forget that. I don't know if you knew this, but D.L. Moody traveled this country preaching the gospel. And at his side, he had a music minister called Ira Sankey. Back when I was growing up in Northern Ireland, we used a hymnal on Sunday nights called Sacred Songs. It was the songs of Ira Sankey. And I was interested to learn a while ago, reading a sermon by Warren Wearsby, that D.L. Moody forbid Sankey to sing Onward Christian Soldiers during his campaigns. You might ask why. Because Moody believed that God's people were less like an army than anybody else. You know, we sing it, but we don't live it. 
And if you're a tick, Moody's kind of thought he's right. I mean, imagine roll call on the average Sunday morning in an evangelical church in Orange County. Private Smith? Well, he's not here, Sarge. You know, he got the sniffles, couldn't come to church this morning. What about Private Jones? Well, he's not here, Sarge, either. He, he's out playing golf. What about Private Schmo? Well, Sarge, he's not here. He's down at the beach with his girlfriend. Does that sound anything like an army to you? No, you're right, son. Kid gets it. Hey, it's simple. This is the image. If you're enlisted, you do what the commander says, you show up on the parade ground, you listen for what the commands are, you click your heels, and off you go. Well, actually, the Germans click their heels, so what do we do? We are salute, and off we go. All right? That's the enlistment that Paul's driving at here. But he not only talks about enlistment, he talks about entanglement. This is really at the heart of what he wants to say. This is kind of the edge of this particular image. Verse 4, no one engaged in warfare. Any enlisted man, any soldier, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life. That's one of the marks of a soldier. A sailor, an airman, they're single-minded. They're men on a mission. The mission dominates. There's a devotion there. In fact, this word entangled can speak of a sheep caught in a thicket. And so the soldier then is someone who is not caught up in the everyday affairs of life and living. He's a man under orders. He's a man on a mission. His mentality is the war is on. You know what? My mother and my father and Jim's mom and dad are children of the Second World War. My girls used to thrill at stories they would tell. The sirens would go off in Belfast as the Germans came overhead to bomb the shipyards of Belfast, which served the British Navy. And they would scoot down to the bomb shelters at the end of their streets. Jun's dad, as a little boy, took a train out into the Scottish countryside to live with the farming community for a while, as many kids did during the Second World War. There was separation from parents. There was food rationing. But no one belly ached. In fact, you'd find them under the subways of London singing together. Because you know why? The war was on. And when the war's on, then you take the rations as they come. You embrace the separations and the hardship as they are. There's that mentality. And that's what Paul's getting at here. The soldier, the enlisted man who makes it his aim to please the commander is a man indeed, who concentrates his energies, determines his choices, and justifies his self-denial in the light of the fact that the war is on. Now listen, I don't think Paul's saying to any Christian man, and especially a Christian minister, don't forget this is a letter to a pastor. I don't think Paul's saying to Timothy, neglect your family, become so impractical that you have no concern about life around you. That would go against other passages. But what he's saying by this image is, look, you know what? In the middle of all your responsibilities, and a soldier has still responsibilities, doesn't he? He's got a wife, he's got children, he's got bills to pay, he's got retirement to look to. All of that's true about a soldier, but you know what? On mission, that kind of becomes secondary. He's willing to lose his life which will leave his wife a widow and his children orphans. That's what Paul's driving at here. He's driving at priority. He's driving at, you know, understanding the war is on. The man of God, the minister of the gospel, commits himself not to get drawn down into the passing affairs of this world. I think that carries the idea of not looking back for ease. We see that in Luke 9, 61 to 62. And I think it also has this idea of forsaking the good for the best. Remember when we were looking at Hebrews 11 and 12? We saw in Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 2, that we're not only to lay aside sin, we're to lay aside weight. And we made the determination that sin is bad, the weight can be good, but it is set aside for that which is best. And we realize in life, guys, the choices we make are not always between what's bad and what's good, what's forbidden and what's allowed. The choices are often between what's good and what's best. 
Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. So there's this single-mindedness. I hope you've got that. I'm not in any way, nor there is Paul, encouraging you to be irresponsible, to neglect your work, to neglect your family. But Paul is saying, hey, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There's a war on. Souls are at stake. The glory of Jesus Christ on planet Earth is at the center of this conflict. Where are you? Have you got your camouflage on and your boots laced up? Or are you sitting on the easy chair with your feet up? Are you entangled in the affairs of this world where life is all about making money, sports, vacations? That's not the lifestyle of the military man. We won't go there, but write it down, Judges 7. Remember the story about, you know, Gideon's army? 32,000 men volunteered to fight the Midianites. God said the army's too big. We're going to thin the ranks a little bit. Tell the guys that, you know, are fearful and want to go home, they can go home, and 10,000 go home. They're left with 22,000. God says, still too many, so take them down to the water's edge, and we're going to put them to a test. A secret test, but a significant test. I want you to watch how they drink the water. And the assumption is they're drinking water in full view of the enemy. And there's two responses. There's the man who seems to hold his weapon in one hand. He kneels down. He brings some water up in his hand and laps it like a dog. Then there's others that seem to lay their swords and spears down, full belly, pig in a trough, head in the water, boom, till they're happy. And it seems that at least by inference, the test is, hey, we'll keep the 300 that have kept their eye on the enemy. Who certainly, you know, nothing wrong with drinking water. An army has to be hydrated and strong. But you know what? The guys that kept themselves ready, kept themselves vigilant, never lost sight of what this is about, even though they were satisfying a physical need. We'll take those guys. I think that's what's being driven at here. You're listening to Know the Truth and the start of a three-part message called Picture Perfect. If you missed any of today's lesson or want to listen again, you can find it at ktt.org. You can also download the KTT app to access all of Philip's complete sermons in the convenience of your mobile device. We live in a distracting and ungodly world, but the more we focus on our devotion, our discipline, and our diligence toward God and His kingdom, the less we're entangled in the cares of this world. And that's why Know the Truth is here, to share the gospel with a world in need of truth so that believers can remain watchful through solid Bible teaching and endure the trials that life brings as they're strengthened by God's words. As a listener-supported program, it's your donations that make this possible. The truth of the gospel is reaching thousands of listeners around the globe because of you. So we'd like to invite you to partner with us by giving a one-time gift of any amount in support of Know the Truth. And when you give this month due to a generous donor, we'll match your gift up to $200,000 through our year-end match. So call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. When you give, you'll receive new morning mercies for yourself, a family member, or a friend. This daily gospel devotional will energize your mornings with the joyful truth of God's Word. We also want to partner with you to share the gospel in a special way. So when you give, Pastor Philip also invites you to send his new book, Contentment, spelled out to a friend or family member of your choice. Select that friend and we'll send it to them for you. Because when you share KTT, you share truth. Again, call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. Before you go, be sure to link up with us on our social media. You'll find us on most platforms when you search for Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Well, I'm Wayne Shepherd. Join us tomorrow as Pastor Philip continues this lesson titled Picture Perfect. That will be Tuesday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Oh,